join us and worship our God with us. Place me on the rock that stand. I hold true to the one who breaks my fall and lifts me time and time again. Oh, my God, so good. You never give up, you never give up on me. Oh, what joy I found because of your love. Because of your love for me Oh my God, so good You never give up You never give up on me Oh, what joy I found Because of your love Because of your love for me This freedom This price, this grace outweighing all my shame. Come on. I made you through the power of sacrifice. From death now raised in life again. Oh my God, so good. You never give up. You never give up on me. Oh, what joy I found because of your love. Because of your love for me Oh my God, so good You never give up You never give up on me Oh, what joy I found Because of your love Because of your love for me Let's keep worshiping. He is good. He's good. Yeah, I'm not a slave to sin, so I'm singing. You are good. Buried with Christ to rise in your freedom. Because you are good. When you make a promise, Jesus, you keep it. You are good. So I'll praise your name as long as I'm breathing Cause you are good Yeah, I'm not a slave to sin, so I'm saying You are good Every with Christ to rise in your freedom You are good You make a promise, Jesus, you keep it Cause you are good So I'll praise your name as long as I'm breathing Cause you are good You never give up, you never give up on me Oh, what joy I found Because of your love, because of your love for me Oh, my God, so good You never give up, you never give up on me Oh, what joy I found Because of your love, because of your love for me Oh, my God, so good You never give up, you never give up on me Oh, what joy I found Because of your love Because of your love for me Oh, my God, so good You never give up You never give up on me Oh, what joy I found Because of your love Because of your love for me yeah, I'm not a slave to sin So I'm singing You are good Buried with Christ to rise in your freedom you are good You make a promise, Jesus, you keep it You are good so I'll sing your name as long as I'm breathing You are good yeah. You are good 
His broken heart declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chain. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King. God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb. For the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Oh, say, who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord? I 
worship you is you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every life, mm, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, turning lives up.
Search the world, but it couldn't feel me. A man's empty praise and treasures of fame are never enough. Then you came along, and put me back together. Is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing. Out of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again.
What's up, Church at Lake Forest? Thank you again for joining us online. My name is Chris Sykes. I get to be one of the pastors here at the church. Uh, I'm so glad that you're watching, whether you're watching on YouTube, on, on Facebook, if you're at live.tcaf.com, watching on our website, wherever you are, make sure you share the link, share the video. We'd love for you to do that. Uh, drop us a comment and let us know that you are that you're watching along with us. We've been meeting back in person for several weeks. As a matter of fact, uh, this week we're kicking our children's ministry off. So if you've got elementary age kids as well as preschool and nursery, uh, then then we've got a spot for them. If you decide to come back and worship with us in person at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, we've got a spot for you. We're still wearing uh, masks. Um, our kids are, are still th that are in elementary. They're wearing masks as well as our students. They're meeting on Sunday nights at uh, at five o'clock. Um, so if you've got you know middle school, high school students, obviously bring them with you on Sunday morning, but bring them back on Sunday nights uh, because that's really a time for them to to hang out. Um, they they eat some food, they play some games. Obviously, they have worship. They have a great time. But we'd love for you to join us in person. There's a lot of stuff that's going to be coming up this fall. I just want to let you know we're meeting. Uh, as staff and elders this week to talk about Halloween, Spooktacular, Christmas, what's that going to look like? And I'll just be honest right now, I don't know exactly. Um, so we're going to put our minds together, we're going to come up with a plan, and then be sharing that with you over the next couple of weeks. But welcome, if you're if you're just now tuning in and you miss worship, man, you, you miss some great music, but we're going to continue worshiping God as we read and we study God's Word. And you are here for the very first week of a series that we are calling Under God. Under God. So glad that you're watching this. Um, and I'm wondering, if, if, if is it just me, or have you also noticed that there's an election going on? Right? I mean, how could you miss it? We are in the middle of I, the craziest year since I've been alive, uh, you know, in my 42 years, this is the this is the craziest year, 2020. Uh, but it's also an election year, and so we're in the middle of this election cycle. And and what I want to do for the next four weeks is really talk to us as, as a church community, as Christians, about what it looks like for us as Christians to be engaged. Now, listen, if you're not a Christ follower yet, if you're if you're tuning in, just kind of see what's going on. Um, you know, if, if you come join us in person, listen, you are welcome. To, to belong to us as a church without believing everything that we believe. We're a church where we say no perfect people are allowed. Um, you can come. It's a safe space to ask questions, um, to, to, to kind of you know, allow your faith to be challenged, and quite frankly, to even challenge our faith. Uh, we, we strongly believe in being iron that sharpens iron. So you may not agree with everything uh, that, that we preach and everything that we believe, but we still would love for you to join us on our journey as we seek God's will and truth in God's Word. Because that's, that's, that's what we believe in and that's what we lean 
on. And so for these next four weeks, this is really for us as Christ followers. We don't go to church. We believe that we are the church. So since we are living as the church out in the rest of the world, how do we communicate with the world? Uh, what, it, what is it that we should be doing during this election season? So we're going to take about four weeks. And, and what I want to do is I kind of want to use the Pledge of Allegiance uh, if you want to, you know, go ahead and kind of say it with me, uh, that, you know, you probably grew up saying this in school just like I did. You may not feel comfortable saying it, so you don't have to. Uh, but I just kind of want to bounce off some ideas over the next four weeks. So here's the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. So it's the end of the pledge that I really kind of want to focus in on for the next four weeks. And, uh, and so this week is going to be One Nation, right? The title of this message is One Nation. What I want to look at this week is really the reality that we are, we may be citizens of the United States of America, or if you're watching from, uh, from some other nation, you know, you may be patriotic to your nation, you may be a citizen of the U.S., but the reality is we are citizens of of a heavenly nation. So we're going to talk a little bit about that this week. And then next week, week two, uh, will be um, under God, under God. So one nation this week, under God next week. And the question that I want to answer is, how do we as Jesus followers, as Christ followers, how do we live under God in a culture that's increasingly hostile toward God and toward the church? Because let's face it, it, it is. And it has been for a long time. And so how do we live as Christians in a world that's increasingly hostile? And then uh, week three, I'm just going to focus on the word indivisible. Indivisible. Listen, at the end of this election season, somebody's going to be president. Somebody maybe that you voted for or maybe the person that you didn't vote for, right? Or you may not even vote. But at the end, there will be Christians who cast ballots for people who won and for people who didn't win. So the question that I want to ask in week three is, how do we as Christ followers stand united? How, how do we stand united spiritually, even though we may have differences politically? I think that's an important topic for us to talk about. And then finally in week four, uh, what may be really the best week, we're going to take a look at the phrase, with liberty and justice for all. And we're going to ask this question, how do we, again, as Christ followers, as Christians in this culture, Continue to love with grace and yet never, ever compromise the truth. We're going to take a little spin on liberty and justice and use the words grace and truth to represent that and talk a little bit about that and what that looks like for us in our culture today. Um, so what I want to do for, for just a second as we, you know, as we get started here is uh, just go ahead and name the candidates the, the two major candidates, I realize that there are some other people running for president, independence, whatever, but uh, I want to name the, the two primary party candidates, and here's what I don't want to happen. This is not a time to cheer or to boo, okay? And I'm serious about this. I'm, I'm not joking. Uh, if, if I say the name of your candidate, I don't want you to cheer, and if I say the name of the person that, you are, that you're opposed to, I don't want you to boo them. But I just I want to go ahead and point out the fact that there are lots of Christians in the world, in, in the U.S. today, who are excited about the possibility that Joe Biden will be the next president of the United States of America and that Kamala Harris will be uh, the vice president. They, they're excited about that possibility. They, they see and they believe that the things that he stands for can lead our country in a new direction, in a different direction. And it's something that, that they would get excited about, that they do get excited about. But we also have to understand that there are some Christians in the United States of America who really are excited about the possibility that Donald Trump will be the next president. They believe that he has been making America great again and that he deserves four more years. And they, and they like the fact uh, that, that his vice president likes to, um, uh, uh, um, Pence likes to, um, you know, pray and read his Bible and go to church. And, uh, and, and so, you know, they'll, they'll vote for the Trump-Pence ticket. And America, quite frankly, 
is fairly evenly divided in any election, in any election. You go back in, 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 in recent modern history for years and years and years, far before I was born, and about 42 to 46 percent of the U.S. will vote Democrat on almost every candidate. And about 42 to 46 percent of the U.S. will vote Republican on almost every single candidate. Now that number varies from year to year, from election to election, and it varies from candidate to candidate, whether you're v voting for president or you're voting for you know, your local mayor or governor or whatever. Uh, but that's kind, of the, that's kind of the numbers. And so that, that leaves you know, 8, 10, you know, maybe 12% at the most in any given year. Uh, of kind of people that, that we would call, you know, the middle, maybe the moderates, you know, maybe they're not, they're, but they're un the undecideds, right? And, uh, and they're the ones, quite frankly, who are kind of, you know, deciding the election. But with all of this uh, give and take and, and, and back and forth, there are a lot of people in our country who are also saying, I don't want to vote for either candidate, right? Is this the best that America can do? Because if this is the best that America can do, I think I'll just stay home and not vote. Then there's some people who are, you know, like they're already packing their bags. It don't matter who, win, who wins, uh, you know, they're thinking about moving to Canada or, or to some other country. And again, they're, they're thinking, is this really the best that our country can do? Other people are saying, you know what, who really cares? It doesn't matter who wins, our country is going to hell in a handbasket, right? And it's just, it's just horrible regardless of, of who wins the election. And so we're, we're, as Christians and as Americans, we're all over the map, right? And so uh, what I want to, I, I want to be clear on the front end um, and just, just transparent about myself and to say that I was raised to be a patriotic American. I mean, I was raised in a Christian household, went to church every week, but we also flew the American flag. You know, I, I, when I was taught that when uh, the flag is being raised, when, uh, you know, when our national anthem is being played, when the pledge is being said, whatever is going on that is honoring to our country, that I'm supposed to stand up. If I'm wearing a hat, I take off the hat. I salute, I sing, I pledge, whatever it is. I was raised to be patriotic, and I'm still a wildly patriotic American today. I like wearing red, white, and blue. As a matter of fact, if I go jump in a swimming pool, my last two pairs of swimming trunks have either been red or, or like I had red and white trunks, and I've got blue and white trunks, right? Um, and, and I think I've got red, white, and blue trunks. I don't know what it is. It seems like I always buy swimming trunks for the summer around July the 4th, and they seem to always be red, white, and blue. I mean, it's just it's just kind of... Who I am, I love my country. I am, I am a patriot. I believe that we live in a country that has been blessed by God. I believe that we that that, that we live in a country that's the land of the free and the home of the brave. I honor those who have fallen in battle to to fight for our freedom. I honor those who haven't fought in battle, who have been honorably just discharged and and, and served in their. You know, they're still living today and they're still honoring those freedoms. Listen, we're, we're remembering, we just remembered this week, those who rushed toward the Twin Towers and those who, who fell in the Pentagon. We remember this week the, the thousands who died, who, uh, who, who rushed in to help those when our country was attacked on our own soil, right? And I honor those people. I want to remember that. I believe that we live in a country of unlimited opportunity. I believe re regardless of your, of your background, where you came from, what you look like, how much money you have today, what, what religion you believe in, that America is a land of opportunity. And, and it's a place where we can worship freely, where we can start businesses, where we can have kids, where, where quite frankly, my family has taken you know, full, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've taken a full measure of all the freedoms and opportunities and privileges that America has to offer, right? We've taken advantage of that. But I also want to be careful and say this, that although I love our country, I, I mean, I, 
I love the United States of America. I can't think of anywhere else in the world that I would rather live. Now, I've, I've never, I've been out of the country a time or two. I've obviously not traveled the world, but as I read and I see, you know, read about and see other countries, there's nowhere else I would rather be. But as much as I love our nation and I wouldn't want to live everybody anywhere else, in God's eyes, America is not the promised land. America is not the promised land. We are not God's only or His favorite nation, right? We're, we're not the only nation under God, and we're not God's favorite nation on the planet. So as Jesus followers, as Jesus followers, it's important for us to understand some things. That, that God loves us, God has blessed us, right? Uh, I, I am blessed when... when uh, members of Congress, or even the you know the whole House or the whole Senate, when they'll pray to to start a session, I, I think that's a blessing to our nation. Um, we have the First Amendment uh, right to free speech, to the free exercise of religion. We have lots of rights guaranteed under our Constitution, but I, I think it's important for us as Americans, but more importantly as Jesus followers to understand that we're not just here to defend the freedom of speech. That's important, right? I believe that the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion, that those are, those are important uh, uh, amendments in the, the Bill of Rights, right? Those are important. Those are important freedoms. But we're not here just to defend the freedom of speech. We're here to help people find freedom in Christ, that's what we've been called to do as Christians, is to help people find freedom in Christ. So no matter how much we may disagree politically, we must, as Christians, understand that the freedom that we are fighting for is freedom that people can only find in Christ. They're never going to find the same freedom on any ballot, in any election, and from either party, ever. They will not. The rest of the world, no matter what country you are from, you will never have the same freedom as the freedom found in Christ. And that's what we're called as Christians to introduce people to. All right? So, what I want you to understand, this is what we're going to look at this week as we talk about this idea of being one nation, right? One nation. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. As one nation... If you're taking notes, write this down. We are not just Americans. We're not just Americans. We are ambassadors from heaven. As a Christ follower, you are an ambassador from heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20 say this. This is about halfway through verse 19. It says, And God gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Listen, God has entrusted to us as Christ followers. That's, that's the us here. God has entrusted to us a wonderful message, a beautiful message, a powerful message of reconciliation, of freedom, of making us of uh, making us right. You know, reconciliation is about balancing the scales of justice, right? And God has given us this beautiful message, this wonderful message of reconciliation. He's entrusted it to us. Why? Verse 20. So we are or because we are Christ's ambassadors God is making His appeal through us. God has called us ambassadors of Christ. And He makes His appeal. In other words, He speaks to the world through us. We have an amazing responsibility as Christ followers. But we also have an amazing calling. We're called ambassadors. Every single one of us. It's not just me because I'm the pastor you know, preaching on the video or, or, or on the stage. All of you, all of us, myself included, we're called to be ambassadors. So what's an ambassador? Here's the definition. An ambassador is the highest ranking diplomat sent as a representative from one nation to another. It's the highest ranking diplomat, right? I mean, lots of, you know, you send spies from one nation to another, right? Or, or visitors, or you may go, you know, visit someplace on a visa or, or whatever. But the ambassador to Uganda, the ambassador to Canada, the ambassador to Russia, to China, to wherever, the ambassador to another nation is the highest ranking diplomat 
that sent as a representative from one, from one nation to another nation. You are an ambassador. You are an ambassador sent from heaven to earth. Let that sink in for just a second. As a matter of fact, repeat this after me. Re repeat this after me. I am an ambassador. Come on, come on, say it with me. Or say it after me. I am an ambassador sent by God from heaven to earth. Say it again. I am an ambassador sent by God from heaven to earth. You are a heavenly ambassador. You are you have been sent out from a heavenly nation to an earthly nation. And as an ambassador, you are a representative of everything that is godly, everything that is holy, everything that is heavenly. You are God's representative here on earth. You are not God and you are not Jesus, but you are His, uh, His, His appointed representative, His ambassador. So, once you understand that, then you need to understand what that means. There's a few things that I want to I want to teach you this morning. If you've never heard this before, as one of Christ's ambassadors, there's a certain there's a certain way we should act. There's certain responsibilities that we have. So, number one, as Christ's ambassador, number one, you were not elected by people, but chosen and appointed by God. Now, elections are important. You know, we we it's it's not just about being a beauty contest or popularity contest, right? We 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 you know we read platforms and we listen to debates and we you know we try to figure out what the what the issues are. Elections on earth are important, but what I want you to understand is you were not elected by any man. You were chosen and appointed by God. You were chosen and appointed by God. John 15, 16 says this: You didn't choose me, I chose you. This is God speaking. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. God chose you. He picked you out. You know, my, my father, my earthly father, is adopted. He's told this story many times. Uh, he has, uh, from his biological mother, seven brothers and six sisters. They were all put up for adoption. Eight boys and six girls. Fourteen children all put up for adoption. And when he found out that he was adopted, his parents, my grandparents, the only grandparents I've ever known, told him, said, son, what makes you different? What makes you special? Is that all those other kids, their parents got stuck with them, but we came and we picked you out. We chose you because there's something special about you. We made you a part of our family. Listen, God chose you. He adopted you. He picked you out. And He appointed you to be His representative, to be His ambassador. So what does that mean for us? Well, that means that man can't stop us. Man don't... Man, uh, uh, Another human being on, on earth doesn't have a say in whether or not we can be used by God because God has chosen to use us, every single one of us. Not just the, the pastor or the deacon or the elder or the Sunday school teacher or the worship leader. You, whoever you are, wherever you are, God has chosen you to be an ambassador. And so, for instance, uh, I can remember... I was at a church um, several years ago. I was on staff. I was a uh, children's pastor, and uh, the church was going through some turmoil. And there was um, there was this very long business meeting one night. And I'm so thankful that we don't do business meetings uh, at our church. We have some family meetings from time to time, and we let you know you know what's going on with the business of the church. But that happens like maybe once a year. Uh, but this was this was a you know a regular business meeting, and it had been going on for a couple of hours, and it was just you know, it's dragging on, and there was a lot of there was there was a lot of arguing and bickering back and forth. And you know, whether it was because I was naive or or I don't know, I mean, I believe that that God wanted to speak some truth through me, and so I stood up and I went to a microphone and I just sort of reminded some people about some truth of God. I reminded the the whole auditorium uh, about some truth of God. Well. Uh, the next day, it was a very large church, uh, kind of, of a politically driven church, unfortunately. And uh, there were people in the room that didn't like what I had to say. And so for several hours the following day, I, have, I had what I now call 
uh, drive-by character assassinations. It was like a drive-by knife in the back. Um, all day long, people coming into my office, not all day long, but for several hours. Um, and for a couple of days, people would just stop by the office and let me know how much they disagreed with what I had to say. And, and how could I possibly be you know, in the position that I was in to say the things that I said and to, to take the stand that I took. And listen, all I did was, was say the truth of God's word because I'm an ambassador of heaven chosen and appointed by God. That doesn't make me better than anybody else. That doesn't make you better than anybody else. But when God's word says, this is true, and you say this is true because God's word says this is true, then there's not a man or woman on the planet that, I mean, they can disagree and they can argue with it, but they can't overcome the truth of God's word. And so sometimes we do take a stand because we are ambassadors who are not elected, but we are chosen by God. God chose you to be his ambassador. So number two, as Christ's ambassador, number one, you're you're not elected, you're chosen, you're appointed by God. Number two, you are not a regular person. You are a royal priest of God. You are not, as, as one of Christ's ambassadors, you are not a regular person. You are a royal priest of God. Pastor Chris, it sounds like you're getting Catholic on me. Well, maybe just a little bit. We don't use the word priest a whole lot you know, in, in Baptist churches and Methodist churches um, in, in, in any, uh, well, in, I guess in just about any church. Um, that that we would say is not Catholic. We're a Protestant church. Um, but you know what? That's what the Bible calls us, right? Whether we use the word priest or we don't use the word priest, here's what God's, God's Word says. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says this, You are a chosen. There's that word chosen again. This is, this is written to Christians, all right? All of us, right? All of us. But you are chosen, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Again, there's the echo. You have been chosen. There's something special about you. And specifically, you are a royal priesthood. Now, uh, if you've never studied the life of Martin Luther, if you're a Protestant, and I'm not talking about Martin Luther King Jr., who was named after Martin Luther. I'm talking about the original Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther started what we now call the Protestant movement uh, on October 31st, 1517, um, you know, hundreds of years ago now. He nailed what's called the 95 Theses to the wall or to the door of the church at, at Wittenberg. And uh, basically, these were the 95 things that he laid out that said, listen, there's, there's some issues with the Catholic Church. And, to not, and, and he wasn't saying that you know, the Catholic Church was not serving God, didn't believe in God, didn't believe in Jesus, but there were some differences. And so he sort of um, set a new direction for what we would now call Protestantism. We are, as Baptists, we're a Protestant church, any church that's any Christian church. That's, that's not Catholic, is basically a Protestant church, right? So, um, but the reason that I bring him up is because even though he had some issues with Catholicism, um, Martin Luther made the phrase, the priesthood of all believers. He kind of coined that phrase. He, he used it all the time. He said that all of us, and the reason that he said this was because we don't, need biblically we're told that we don't need a priest between us and God that that we all of us are part of a royal priesthood and so we believe in our theology in our in our church we believe that we are all a priesthood of all believers just like Martin Luther taught we believe that's what the bible says in other words a common christian Anybody sitting in a chair in a pew watching online right now, that you are a priest. That in the eyes of God, it's not the pastor preaching the message who is the priest over you or, or representing you to God. No, you represent yourself to God. That you are a priest. 
You are called to be, whether you use the word priest, you can use the word pastor, you can use, you know, a more modern term like a spiritual influencer, right? You know, your social media influencer. Well, now you're a spiritual influencer on social media. That's what this verse is all about. You're a royal priesthood. God called you. He set you apart. Why did he do that? Why did he make you a holy nation? Because so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Our job is to, your job is to declare the praises of God. We just spent five weeks talking about the heartbeat of God and what it looks like to have a, uh, to be a man or a woman after God's own heart, to worship Him, to declare His praises to the nations. That's what we're to do as a royal priesthood. So, like, don't put yourself down. Don't, don't think that you're less than the pastor. It's like, you know, every time I go out to eat or I, I go to a to family members' houses or, you know, wherever. If I'm, if I'm in a group of people and we're about to have a meal together, most often people, you know, it's, it's like all the eyes in the room kind of move toward the pastor, right? As you know, as you're sitting down at the table or whatever, and, uh, and they say, Pastor, will you, will you pray for us? <laughs> it makes me sometimes just want to say, no, no, I don't, I don't, I think I'll pass. I think I'll pass today. Why don't you pray for us? You know, I'm just not feeling it today, but since you're a royal priest, why don't you pray, right? That would freak some of you out, but the reality is you're a royal priest. You're, you are just as much a pastor of other people, shepherding, leading, guiding, or at least you should be just as much as I am. There's, there's not this professional class in the Bible, we are all the same in God. There's, there's neither Jew nor Greek, free nor slave, male nor female. Like, like in the eyes of God, yes, there are men and women, okay? I'm not, I'm not going down the, the gender trail there. Um, but in the eyes of God, we're all equal. That's the point. That regardless of what your background is, you're called to be a part of this royal priesthood of believers, so everybody, everybody has a role in shepherding somebody else as a pastor. That's, that's what we're supposed to be as this one nation. You are chosen. If you're a Christ follower, you are chosen. You are called. God is equ- You may not feel equipped, but God is equipping you, and you are equipped. When you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you are equipped. You are a priest of the Most High. You are a priest of the Most High. So... As a Christ follower, as an ambassador, remember, you're not elected by people, but you're chosen by God. Number two, you're not a regular person. You are a royal priest of God. Wear that with honor. Wear that with dignity, right? But then number three, you never represent yourself. See, it'd be real easy for me to say, wear that with honor, wear that with dignity, for your chest to kind of, you know, so then I'm in charge. I'm the royal priest, right? No, no, no. Number three, as an ambassador of Christ, you never represent yourself. You always represent Christ. You never represent yourself. And when I say never, I mean like you never represent yourself. Every decision that we, that we make, we're supposed to make it through the lens and, and from the standpoint that we are the representative from heaven to earth, right? That God has chosen us. He's set us apart. He's made us a holy nation, a royal priesthood to be the ambassador from the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of America or to whatever nation that you live in, that you're watching from. 1 Peter 2.12 says this, Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Okay? Be careful. It would be easy to get puffed up. It would be easy to to maybe lose our tempers. It would be easy to, to slip into any kind of sin. But it says, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when He judges the world. Listen, we are a place where no perfect people are allowed. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes. But when we admit to those mistakes, when we lose our temper and then we say, hey, listen, I should not have done that. I should not have said that. I should not have posted that. I should not have acted that way. God expects more of me. I expect more of me. Just let me, can I, can we, can I back that up? Can we start over? 
can help mend the relationship. When we act with honor, that's what 1 Timothy 2.12 is talking about. Even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they'll see the way that you are honorable to them. They'll see your honorable behavior, and they will give honor to God when He judges the world. That's our job as an ambassador. Listen, as a pastor, you often hold me to a higher standard, right? And the reality is, in my teaching, I am held biblically to a a higher standard. But, you know, if if I post something on Facebook, I make an off-colored joke or, you know, whatever, um, or, you know, I've been known occasionally to lose my temper, you know, believe it or not, um, whatever, you might say something like, well, I mean, Pastor, you're, you're better than that. Like, like you're held to a higher standard. You're supposed to be perfect all the time. And then it, you know, then it hurts really it's for some of us. And for some of you, it hurts your feelings. If you see any pastor, not just me, but any pastor messing up because, you know, you, you've sort of put this, this man up on a pedestal. You've, you've raised the standard of the pastor. You've put him way up here. And then when he does not meet that standard, it, it somehow impacts your faith. I'm not trying to get you to lower your standard of me or to lower your standard of other pastors. That's not the goal of of 1 Peter 2.12. The goal is not to say, okay, so, so all the pastors need to come down to this level. That's not the goal. The goal is to raise your standard because you realize that you are a priest. You are a pastor. You are a part of a holy nation. You are an ambassador. You are the flagship representative from heaven to earth to represent Christ to the world. And so all of us, and listen, again, none of us are going to be perfect, right? We're, we're, we're going to mess up from time to time. But the lifestyle that we live, the, the direction that we should be going is becoming more and more and more like Christ. And so as we become on the outside, what God has already made us on the inside, what we're actually doing is we're elevating our standard. Remember, God's standard is perfection. In this earth, in this body, with this flesh, we will never meet that perfection. But His standards should be our standard. And so our standard is to try to live perfectly, according to 1 Peter 2.12, live properly among our unbelieving Neighbors, as a pastor, you might you might hold me to a higher standard, but all of us should hold ourselves to a higher standard. Your standard is Christ. Your standard is Christ. And what did Christ say? Christ said to show love. He he said to his disciples uh, at, at at the Last Supper, just before he was arrested and he was crucified. He said, "A new command I give you: love one another." And he didn't say, "Love one another." as you want to be loved or or treat one another. It's not the golden rule. They'd heard that before. But this was the new command, was to love one another just as I have loved you. Where we love selflessly, where we give ourselves up just like Jesus gave Himself up for us. As husbands, we're told to love our wives as Christ loved the church and, and gave Himself up for the church. That's the way that all of us are supposed to love one another. We're supposed to love one another just as Jesus loves us. Which is an overwhelming, undeniable love that that, that we cannot grasp, we, we can't explain, but we can certainly try to model it for other people. Remember, um, Jesus did not tell His disciples that the world will know that you're my disciples by the way that you vote. He didn't say to the world, or He didn't say to the disciples, the world will know that you're you're my followers by whether or not you, you march or you stay at home or you defend the Second Amendment. No, He said, The world will know that you're my disciples, that you're my followers, that you're Christians, that you're Christ followers. The world will know that you're my disciples by the way that you love. 
Our standard is the love of Christ. As one of Christ's ambassadors, you do not represent yourself. You represent the love of Christ. Yes, you may have some interests. Yes, you have a political leaning. Yes, you, you, you can take a stand on a policy. But at the end of the day, it's not about how you vote who you vote for, or what stand you take for or against any political policy. It's not about defending the freedoms that we have in the United States of America. Remember, it's about introducing people to the freedom that they can have in Christ. That is who we represent. We represent freedom in Christ. Don't sell yourself short. Don't say, What I believe is not that important. I'm just a regular Christian. I don't have a voice. Yes, you do. You have been chosen. You are a royal priesthood, part of a holy nation, chosen and appointed by God to introduce people to the freedom of Christ. But Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, aren't you worried about the election? Don't you you think that that if Biden gets elected, that this is going to happen? Don't you think that if Trump gets elected that the world will be a darker place? What if, what if Christians lose their rights? What if the church becomes even more persecuted in the United States of America? Listen, no matter who is elected, no matter who is elected, your party does not have to be in charge for God's will to be done. Your party does not have to be in charge for God's will to be done. God was on the throne long before you were born, long before I was born. He is a sovereign, all-knowing God whose plan will come to pass and whose will will be done. God is not surprised. He is not changed. His plan has not been, will not be thwarted by an election in the year 2020 in one nation, on one planet, in just one of the solar systems, in just one of the galaxies of the universe that God created and is in charge of. Yes, the 2020 election may be the most important election of your lifetime, but it is not the most important date happening in the world, in the universe, in God's timeline. It was the birth, life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the most important thing that we can share with people. That is the most important date that we can celebrate, that we can remember that God, that Jesus, that God became flesh and dwelt among us and that Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. Every time you take it and you eat it, every time you take it and you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And then Jesus died for us and he rose again. The election is important, but it's not as important as pointing people to Jesus If persecution becomes greater, guess what happens? The church becomes stronger. If the world becomes darker, guess what happens? The light of the love of Jesus Christ shines brighter. It's not the end of the world regardless of the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. Remember, we are not just ambassadors. You, I mean, we're not just Americans. <laughs> you are not just an American. Fr- quite frankly, you're not just, if you're watching from another country, you're not just a, 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 a Canadian. You're not just an Algerian. You're not just a Cuban. Uh, you know, you, you're not just a Haitian. You're not just an African American. You're not just a white European American. You are an ambassador of Christ. You are a royal ambassador. You are part of a holy nation sent by God from heaven to earth to represent and declare the name that is above all names, the name that will not be on a ballot in a couple of months, but but a name that should be on all of our lips every day, every year, every moment of our lives. That is the name of Jesus Christ, the name that is above every name, that at His name, 
Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We are a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. I love my country. I love my country. But I worship a different king. And we are under his nation. Let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father God, we come to you this morning as a church universal that may be divided politically. We may have our differences in a president that we would choose, in a policy that we would support, in a political platform that we that we would be opposed to. God, we, we may have those differences, but we are one nation. We're part of a heavenly nation. So God, we confess that this morning. God, we agree together that you have called us by your name, that you have chosen us and you have appointed us as your royal ambassadors. And so, God, this morning we take on that mantle. God, we, we want to confess this, the, the sin of pride. We want to confess the sin of arrogance. God, we, we want to confess the sin of, of hating other believers and unbelievers, of making it all about us, God, and not all about you. And so, God, remind us this week that it's, it's, it may be important to defend the freedom of speech or the freedom of religion, but God, what's most important is that we're pointing people to freedom in Christ. God, remind us of that every week, every moment of our days. And God, if there are any watching this morning who have not trusted you as their Savior, God, I pray in this moment you begin to pierce their hearts. And listen to me, wherever you are, if you're watching, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, I want you to hear this. Look at the TV. Look at me. Listen. Jesus loves you. The Bible says that we have all sinned, that God has a perfect standard, but that we have all sinned and we've fallen short of God's perfect standard, that none of us are perfect. I'm not perfect. You are not perfect. But the Bible also teaches us that God loves us too much to leave us that way, that God so loved the world, the whole world, that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says that the what we earn for the sin that we do is death. It's a, it's, a, it's a separation from God for all of eternity. And God did not create us for that. He created us to have a relationship with Him. But in our sin, that relationship has been broken. This world has been broken. And so God sent His one and only Son, Jesus, to live a perfect life and to do for us what no one else can do. He died to pay the penalty for our sins. He was sinless. But He gave Himself, He gave His life to die to pay for your sins and to pay for my sins. And then He took it one step further and He did something else that none of us could ever do. He didn't stay dead. He brought Himself back to life. The Bible teaches us that He arose on the third day. He proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that He was who He said He was, that He was God in the flesh, God the Son sent by God the Father, into a broken, sinful world as a sinless sacrifice to save you and to save me from our sins. And so if you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, what I want to encourage you and invite you to do today is to do just that. It's to simply understand that we are all sinners, that you are a sinner, that you are not perfect, but that you have a Savior who loves you. And when you trust Jesus as your Savior, then God adopts you into His holy family, into His heavenly family. And like I've been preaching this morning, you become an ambassador, a royal priesthood, part of a holy nation, chosen by God as His very own. And God loves you. So if that's your desire this morning, I just want to encourage you to continue praying with me. Make my words your words. You don't have to say them out loud, but I certainly want to encourage you to right where you are to say them out loud. But even if you don't say it with your, with your mouth, at least say this, make this the prayer of your heart. But the Bible does say that if we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, then we will be saved. So I want to encourage you to, to say this out loud with me. Just continue praying with me. Wherever you are, say this. Dear Jesus, 
Thank you for loving me. I realize that I'm not perfect, that I'm a sinner. But Jesus, thank you for saving me. I'm trusting you to forgive me of my sins. Jesus, come into my life. Fill me up. I want to be more like you. God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for calling me one of your children. I trust you, and I'm committing the rest of my life to live for you. God, it is all about you. It is not about me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer this morning, if if that was the desire of your heart, welcome to the family of God. Let us know. Send us a message. Drop us a comment. Make sure you you share this video. You can you can you know email us. Go go to the go to our website at tcaf.com. You can find out more information there. Come visit us in person. We would love to talk to you about baptism. Let us know and let your family know the decision that you made this morning to trust Jesus as your Savior. Listen, guys, I love you. I want to invite you to join us for week two as we continue this series next Sunday morning at 10 a.m. I love you guys. Have a great week.